So hi everyone, Olaf here from Performance Digital and today with me is George Wang, who is an entrepreneur who has been a plastic surgeon and has been extremely experienced with running finances of multiple businesses and now is helping entrepreneurs with finding their way to running their machines, their uh, enterprises efficiently. Hi, George. Great to have you. Olaf, thank you for having me here. Yeah, I just did a bit of an intro, but if you can start by telling us a bit more about yourself and about your extraordinary journey to entrepreneurship. <laughs> well, long story short, so you know how a lot of entrepreneurs, they get their financial statements from their bookkeeper, whether they're a startup or they've been in business for a long time. Sure. And then they go cross-eyed. They're like, what does this mean? What profit and loss statement? What is that, right? And uh, that was me back in 1995 when I started my plastic surgery practice in Seattle, Washington. Had no clue about how to run a business. I didn't even know I was the business. I was just spent seven years after medical school training to be a plastic surgeon. And unfortunately, within a couple years, I was nearly bankrupt. My accountant suggested I declare bankruptcy. I knew I didn't know what to do, but I figured... That's not good advice. <laughs> if I can figure out how to become a plastic surgeon, I'll figure out how to run a business. So I, I, I studied business finance. I studied marketing, I studied selling. Not that I enjoyed it. I didn't want to become a marketer, <laughs> but I wanted to be a surgeon. But that's what I had to do to survive. So I, I turned things around. It wasn't, plastic surgery wasn't really what I thought it was going to be. My, my dream job had turned into the nightmare of my day. And I ended up doing a lot more cosmetic surgery I signed up to do reconstructive surgery. And I don't have anything against cosmetic surgery, but I, a couple years before I retired, my wife told me if I kept going like that, I was going to die an early death. So oh. I knew I had to find a way out. So there, the real trigger was when our, our youngest was born. And I realized I don't want to spend time away from my family doing a, a job, pursuing a career I no longer enjoyed any longer. So I left. No, not passionate about it any longer, right? I wanted to be a plastic surgeon since I was 17. And at the age of 40, that dream was complete, done. I, I check it off the list. And I'm wondering, I, I just want to hear about this transition or transformation. Yeah. So you've realized, right. yeah, your accountant is informing you, George, you're, become, you're about to become bankrupt. And then yeah. what do you do? What was your sort of a process? What was the thing that your journey to, yeah. to, be, to, to turning things around? Well, one of the big things I had to do was deal with my emotions. Because I, at that point, I felt really embarrassed, humiliated. It was very depressing. I, I wasn't, I should have been clinically depressed. I wasn't for whatever reason. I think I have a lot of resilience from seven years of surgical residency and coming out of you know college being a competitive tennis player. But still, that can get the best of us and depression or not. I just had to say, okay, well, what am I going to do? I have to keep taking steps forward, even if it's tiny, tiny steps. And I, I looked for help. I looked for advice. But back in 1995, it wasn't easy. I, every time I did a search online for business financial advice, I kept getting insurance brokers. We can sell you with life insurance and what? <laughs> we can do financial planning. That's not what I need. I need business advice. So I started looking around for classical marketers and, and learning how to have conversations with people. I took courses and training programs outside of medicine in, in communication. I did that for two reasons, not just for the business, but I also knew from a, a professional standpoint that in traditional, the traditional medical training, we don't learn a lot about communication. So I took a lot of training about that. And I was just became a student of everything business and kept my eyes out for things. I asked a lot of questions, read a lot of books. So how long did it took you from nearly bankrupt to mm -hmm. like, okay, I know what is happening in my business. I know where yeah. the finances are going. I yeah. understand that if I do this, then this will have this will be the effect in six months from now or, or 10 right. months from now or 12 months from now. How long did it actually took you to get that understanding that is, as I understand, the, the base of your current product, right? 
probably from the that point. So that would be 1995 to 1997. My accountant de- said, hey, declare bankruptcy. I'm like, no way. So probably three years from that point so of just really intensive. Yeah, so pretty yeah. good, I would say. Three years is, is a long period of time, especially for nowadays <laughs> people that think that they are going to do to build a business overnight. Yeah. But on right. the other hand, three years from almost being bankrupt to mm-hmm. have a good understanding about uh, business, about yeah. finances and so on, it's, it's, that's a pretty good MBA uh, on steroids, I would say. Yeah, you're right, it was MBA. But it was three years, looking back, three years seems quick, but at the time it was really Olaf, it was miserable. I just, I can even feel it in my body, like I could probably be an actor and <laughs> act out the part. It just felt horrible. To go through all that training. I I do understand you because I don't have such an experience as you, but I have a similar one. So my ex-business partner years ago decided to empty the bank account one day of the business that was running, that had uh, bills to pay, that had outstanding invoices to pay. And all of a sudden, this guy has decided to to empty our bank account. It was it's a long story, and there is a lot more to it. But still, I was so stressed during that period of yeah. time because that was totally irresponsible of him. Of course, it was illegal. I right. I could sue him and so on, but that's mm-hmm. another story. But when you said I can feel it in my body, that is the something that I still have to this day when I think about those right. moments. Uh, those weeks, yes. those months that I had to keep on running on a treadmill constantly to save the business yep. and, and to save myself. So I, I can relate to what you are saying, definitely. Yeah. Go to the, let's say, lesson of your experience of what you can yeah. give to other entrepreneurs out there. What do you think is the most important metric or think in managing small and medium business finances? that people should keep in mind, should be constantly mm. aware of and so on. Oh gosh, there's so many, <laughs> I'm like going in on many directions. I would start with something non-financial actually, Olaf. I would start with why? What is the compelling reason why you're doing what you do? What is the purpose of the business? And the reason I say start there rather than, okay, look at these numbers, look at those numbers is because things are gonna get tough. No matter what, things, there are going to be challenges, unexpected. Look at what happened with you. Look what happened with me. Did we ever think this is going to, not in our wildest imagination, <laughs> it's no way. <laughs> That's not going to happen to me, <laughs> right? But I think what kept me going is that I had a big drive from the inside. I really wanted to be the best plastic surgeon that I could be. And I believed, even I, no question, I had doubts along the way, but I, overall, my beliefs were stronger than my doubts. I believed that I could pull through this somehow. Didn't know how, didn't know all the details. There's a ton of stuff I didn't know, but I started learning. All right. So then what I learned along the way in terms of how to turn things around in terms of business finance and the marketing and selling that comes with it is to be clear about where, where am I trying to go? Because if I'm not clear, then I can do anything. I can be busy doing things. And none of it will matter if I don't know the direction that I'm headed in, all right? So I've learned the hard way that I had to understand financially, where am I trying to go? What are my targets? Not that I'm going to hit those specific targets, but it gives me a way to focus. It gives me a way to understand, okay, if I have these activities, if I focus on these activities, is that going to get me to the target? Sometimes the answer is no way. Not a chance. That's not even going to come close, right? It's a shiny object, yeah. right? And It'd be fun. Is, and I think that this is one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs overlook and even seasoned ones. When you yeah. think about your business and you think about the goals and as the business grows, you can also get into this trap because you have a goal in mind and you think, okay, I can scale this in that direction. Mm-hmm. I can go in that direction. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the question, if my business is ready for it, or if with the current setup that I have, current amount mm-hmm. of employees, current set of services, current pricing model that I have, I am able to do it. And sometimes these things are not very much on the same page, if you know what I'm trying to say. 
hundred percent. Yeah, the infrastructure you have for your business and the systems that you use to run your business at one level, it may not. It's not going to serve you when you try to scale up. Exactly. Things are going to break. This is very predictable. Yeah. And to go further, Olaf, I once spoke with a professional marketer years ago, and he said, "Well, I don't think there's any financial problem that better marketing won't help." And that is so wrong. I've seen businesses quote do better marketing and nearly go bankrupt、yeah. I, because if you have the wrong infrastructure and you do better marketing, how do you serve those people? How do you serve those customers? Kind of right, moving parts that you have to take <laughs> care of simultaneously because. There are things that shift constantly, and it's not just about multipliers. So, okay, I have、yes. X Y Z calls. I can double these. If I can double these, I can double the sales. Okay, but how about the culture then? What if we start、yep. hiring at the extreme speed? And this is sometimes、uh, trouble、yes. and, and, and challenge of startups because they are they have money to burn. They are hiring like、mm. crazy. But what about culture? Is this still?、Yeah. Scalable, and can we still communicate our mission, our values to people? Exactly. If we are hiring a couple of or dozens of people per month, it's yep, it's very、exactly. hard and might be unpredictable. And there are so many moving parts that you can come across that you should be on on constant action mode, constant vigilance about what is、yes. going to happen. What do you need to do with your business? So, can you tell me how do you use your past experiences with? Helping your current clients with helping other entrepreneurs manage their finances. Yeah. So when I practiced as a plastic surgeon, I took a very holistic approach, which back in the '90s and early 2000s wasn't as common as it is now, right? And I was actually criticized for pra- practicing in a holistic manner by some people. But I take that same mindset to the business world. So if you're looking at your business finances. You have to look holistically and look at well, what feeds the finances? Yes, cash coming in and cash going out. But what is the end? What are the engines behind that? And those engines are indeed sales and marketing. So the financial sales and marketing engines are all linked together. But a lot of people don't think of it that way. Like I said, one marketer told me there's no financial problem that better marketing won't help. It's just not true because if you do better marketing, how do you know that's the right goal? How do you know that's going to turn into sales? And if you're selling, how yeah, do you know that's going to right? And if you have a good marketing, and and the sales does not come hand in hand with the marketing, what's、exactly. the purpose of having hundreds of leads per even per day if your sales、exactly. team is not interested in pursuing them actively and closing them efficiently、exactly. and so on? Yes, or if they're the not very good quality marketing leads, right? Exactly. So a lot of things can go wrong, but it's so that's why it's important to look holistically at what's happening in the business. It's what we airline pilots call it situational awareness. We have situational awareness in the operating room as well, and you have to have situ situational awareness of the business in a very holistic manner, including, as you pointed out, company culture, because if your company culture is toxic, it's going to affect every single op- a- aspect of your business. From customer service to the attitudes and the actions of the people in the marketing and sales teams and the financial teams, everywhere, it's going to be very, very difficult to build a successful business. Now, of course, we can find exceptions to the rule, right?、Yeah. But we're not looking for exceptions. We're looking for reliability and predictability, right? And even, like I said, even if you have a great culture, it's not a guarantee of success. There are so many. It's very complex, but. I'm a big fan. Going back to surgery, of focusing on fundamentals. That's how we were ta- we were trained: is focus on fundamentals. And whatever situation we get to run into in the operating room, we can understand how to handle it. And the same thing in business: financial management, sales management, marketing management, linked together. It's a fun- fundamental principle that's very, very rarely taught. That's so true. I think that there is a scarcity. Of organizations that understand, especially in SMEs, because with corporates, with big organizations, when there are already processes, dozens of years of experience and growth and mistakes, of course, that happen、yeah. along the way, it's a bit different. Because I think then you have the overkill of processes, right? Some,、mm-hmm. at least、yes. sometimes. 
But in smaller yes. organizations, I think there is scarcity of these that understand that it's not only about having exceptional product. It's not only about having good customer service. It's not only about having efficient sales or efficient marketing. You need to proactively identify the bottlenecks, the obstacles, potential challenges, yes. overcome these, and then strive for greatness, strive for success. 100%. Yeah. And the things that you look at today and identify may be different than what happens tomorrow, right? True. So I think it's important. A lot of, especially in the startup early phases, a lot of people operate from their guts. They're like, Olaf, I feel like we should do more marketing on LinkedIn. Well, based on what? How do you know what's working? Well, look at the numbers, right? To see what's working, what's not working. But mm, a lot of times people don't use their data to inform their decision making. I'm a fan of using both your intuition, instinct or intuition and intellect, information. Use both. I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think that if your gut is telling you that there might be a niche somewhere or there might be yeah. a need, go ahead and pursue that feeling. And, and yeah. it happened to yep. me. But I think I was in the same amount of cases I was wrong as I was right. Mm -hmm. But right. I verified this with data. Yeah. So if you think exactly. that there is a niche, there is something that you can pursue, pursue it, but measure. Measure the exactly. efficiency of the efforts, marketing efforts, yeah. sales efforts, and then either reiterate in that or change your mind, change the perspective, shift your attention and so on. Exactly. Yes. I was just going to say, I think that especially in the early stages of a business, there's the temptation to just go, okay, this is my gut. I'm going to follow it and not look at the information, not get, not measure how things are going because it just has, it feels good. We're doing something. We're active. We're in motion. Which this is going to work. And that's naive. I think this is a challenge that many early stage teams have with products. Yeah. So I also, I co-own a software development company and I've been a part of many different workshops that were aiming to conceptualize a new product. And sometimes entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs have identified a very interesting segment of the market, but they are so tempted by to have, needing to have a certain product, address this with a perfect solution that they yeah. forgot about the test phase, about, okay, let's just set up a simple process, have an Excel sheet, have a team of you know, marketers or salespeople and try if this actually will fly, if this works. Because a yes. lot of people are focusing on solving something with a technology that does not require solving with technology. It just requires processes behind in order to prove the point. And once you prove the point, then you have incoming revenue, it's easier to go to investors, go to angel investors to, to seed companies and get funding for something that is actually proven and not spend your own money and then conclude after six months and half a million dollars in that it's probably not going to apply. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the challenge to that, Olaf, is that it's easier to hide behind a computer and work on things than it is for a lot of people to go out and have conversations and discover what is the market saying, right? And I think that one of the reasons for that, and I see this amongst a lot of entrepreneurs that are objecting to realities today, sir, is that a lot of people are so artistic in their approach. Yeah. I was like that also. I mean, I was totally sure that I'm going to be right. I am right at this very moment. And I learned through entrepreneurship most of the times I'm wrong, but there is no shame in being wrong. Yeah. Once you conclude this at the right moment in time. Well, the important thing, we are going to be wrong, right? There's no question about it. The important thing is to identify when we're wrong sooner than later, right? And even if it happens later down the road, uh, it's important to make to understand how to make the appropriate course corrections. Let's get back to your sort of approach and your work with yeah. your clients. Can you share some sort of story? It can be, of course, anonymous story in which mm -hmm. you were successfully able to help someone that had a financially related challenge in their business. Well, 
There's a lot of them. Let's see. I can think of one that happened relatively recently. It was in this past fall. So just as a background, what I do with clients is I help them to set financial sales and marketing goals that are interconnected. And we start by setting the financial goals first, which includes profit. It includes reinvestment back into the business and then the rest of their overhead. And once we've set the financial goals, then we set the sales goals that if they meet the sales goals, they'll reach their financial goals. And then once we've set the sales goals, we set the marketing goals at a level that if they meet, reach their marketing goals, they'll hit their sales goals. So we have financial sales and marketing goals all interconnected. Okay. If we do that. Then we want to measure progress against those goals, actual progress and predicted progress. And we also want to understand and predict cash flow months in advance. Okay, so I had a client. It's a uh, $3.6 million revenue business. They've been around for many years, probably over 25 years, but a new owner, two year old own or owner for two years. And we were looking at cash flow for uh, headed into the new year. And the accountant said, oh, I did some projections and it looks like cash flow is going to be fine going into the two th into the new year. Oh, and then I forgot to mention what was happening is the principal producer was going to be having surgery. So it's going to be out for a few weeks. OK, so that's going to obviously affect production. And but the accountant said, oh, I think cash flow is going to be fine. Well, I put the numbers into my software because all she did was a little simple on paper spreadsheet thing. And I it didn't feel right. Oh, th this one, my gut sense was like, wait, no, something this something doesn't is off. compute. <laughs> something. I see it on the spreadsheet, but mm, no. And so I put it into my software and I predicted they were going to uh, have a significant, serious cash flow crisis. So I had a separate conversation with my client and I said, I, I get with all respect to the accountant, I get that the, she's saying it's going to be fine, but I'm not sure. And here's why. So I pull up my software and I show my, my projection. So what we did is we took actions to reduce the cash that was going out, reduce the spend, reduce the burn. And we avoided the cash flow crisis. And you know what this funny Olaf, my client goes, he was kind of almost disappointed after this all passed. And he said, I don't know what that was all about. We didn't have a cash flow crisis. And it almost felt like he was like, see, you're wrong. <laughs> oh, you didn't have a well, yeah, we avoided a crash. But since there was no crash, there is no nothing to cheer for because nothing yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> see, George, you were wrong. We didn't have a crisis. I'm like, I'm glad I was wrong. That's a good one. Interesting one. Yeah. So besides this story, what would you say to the entrepreneurs that are right now looking to scale their businesses? What is the, and, and also taking into account the current context, economical context uh, throughout the mm -hmm. world, macroeconomical context. What yeah. would you say is the, maybe that strategy, because that's hard to hate, have universal strategy yeah. for various businesses in different industries. But what would be your advice to, to keep in mind for 2024? Well, I would say 2024 and beyond. I think it's really important to ask the question, am I solving a problem that my audience knows that they have and that they want to solve? And there are different layers to that because it's easy to give a very high level answer. Oh yeah, I'm solving this problem. But if you go and talk to people who have that problem, you'll learn that there are different ways that they define the problem. There are different ways they talk about it. There are different ways they go about solving that problem. Okay. And that the way they go about solving that problem may or may not align with the way you're proposing to solve the problem with your business. So I think it's important to always be asking, even if you're already quote successful, are we solving a problem that our audience knows that they have? Otherwise you'll be a solution in search of a problem to solve. Very and there's, important. you and I know there are a lot of businesses out there that never made it. <laughs> That's very important. And there are many products that are not fit for the market or that are solving the same problem as different businesses of these sorts. And there are exactly. still problems out there. There are still challenges out yeah. there that are not being taken care of. The entrepreneurs throughout the world telling each other about during conferences, talking over coffees and lunches and so on. And they're still not addressed properly. So exactly. I think that what you're saying here is very important. What would be your advice for a new upcoming entrepreneur? So a lot of people nowadays are dreaming of becoming solopreneurs, of building their own businesses, platforms, solutions, being, being out there as a brand. What would be your mm -hmm. advice for these 
new upcoming entrepreneurs. I yeah. would say to adopt a mindset, as I mentioned earlier, adopt a mindset of thinking holistically. Think in terms of a 360 degree view of your business based on the problem that you're looking to solve for a particular audience. Who is that audience? And you may that audience may change based on your asking questions and discovering who's out there and who really wants your solution. But take a holistic view in terms of what needs to happen from the financial sales and marketing side and from the operational side and the customer delivery side. Think of being, be thinking about these holistically all the time. Not literally, I mean, in the background all the time, but on a particular moment, you may be focused on the finance or marketing or operations or some sort of crisis that's happening. But adopt a mindset of looking at all the moving parts, not just one little piece. Oh yeah, we're really great at building our product. This is very common. Yeah, but you're horrible at bringing onboarding customers. You're horrible at customer support. When people have questions, they can't find you. Yeah, but it, it takes care of itself. Well, really, how do you know, right? So be thinking about that. I also think it's important to set your goals. And a goal is not just to judge yourself, good or bad. A goal is simply to have a place to focus because if you're not focused on where you're going, any road will do. Hey, we're busy, Olaf. Yeah, we're successful. Really? Where are you headed? I don't know, but we're really busy. I think that this is the, the last one is super important because I am right now seven years in business, built and sold one business, built the second one, now in the process of building a third one, but I'm still learning this about myself. Yeah. Like yeah. being busy, solely for being busy and i think this is the trap that it's so easy to walk into i mean so easy because yeah. you always have emails to respond you always have uh, tasks yep. to juggle but asking yourself constantly or at least regularly is this the right way to do it is this something yes. that i and my business need at this moment in time. Is this the most exactly. efficiently spent time? That I think these are yeah. very important ones. 100%, time. I do that as well. I ask myself, hey, this was the right strategy and tactic six months ago. Is it still valid now? That's very important. And I think that, I don't know if this is coming from, I think this is coming from Warren Buffett when he said something in the lines like, being an entrepreneur is saying no to almost everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is, there are so many things we could be doing. There are lots of shiny objects around, yeah. right? And it's sometimes but, very hard to tell the shiny from the shinier from the shiniest. Yes. And the other thing, I think under pressure, when fear starts to creep in or fear of we're embraced just paralyzed by fear, the temptation is to try to do everything. Every What was the movie? Everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. Right? I think so. Yeah. And the, te the temptation is there, but the it, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's it's simply fear-based action. Yeah, and and in can, general, fear-based action. And you action, can spread yourself too thin and it's very easy to do. Exactly. So George, to just to sort of a sum it up, can you tell us about where can we find you? And what is the message that you have for, for the audience? Yeah, I'll start with the message. The message is to think holistically. And in terms of setting where you're going to focus on setting financial sales and marketing goals that are linked together. This is not commonly done, especially in the smaller business ranges, but financial sales and marketing goals that are interconnected and then measure your progress towards those goals. Where people can find me is my website, moreprofitrocket.com. And I have an app called Profit Stash. You can find that on the website. It's myprofitstash.com as well. One resource where I would direct people as a starting point to begin thinking holistically is on my website, moreprofitrocket.com. You can find the More Profit Blind Spot Scanner. If you click through, it'll ask you a few questions and then it'll send you a PDF. It will identify profitability blind spots in a very holistic manner from operations, finance, sales, and marketing. Awesome. That's awesome. the place to start. Super valuable. So yeah. We are going to link uh, all of this uh, blog okay. video. George, it Fantastic. was a pleasure as always. Thank you very yeah. much for joining, for having this awesome conversation and best of luck to you and, and your business efforts. Thanks, Olaf. It was a pleasure. Thanks.